This podcast is not a substitute for a relationship with a mental health professional. Okay, so, and now you are ranked. Where you ranked at? You doing well? You you did it in eight years. You said, "What's the ranking? What's the, what is it uh, called?" Let's be clear. First class. Okay, so you sergeant first first class. Yep. Okay, um, tunnel vision. Uh, I love the way you said. Um, wow, you found a support system. That would Absolutely. lift you up Absolutely. when the moods was when your mood was low, Absolutely. whatever. Okay, if you was having some depression or some sadness or overly anxious, you found a support system yes. in the service. Okay, so now you're this high-ranking officer, and you are, and you still are handsome as I don't know what, fine as I don't know what. I can remember you calling me, telling me um, when we be talking and I'd be like, well, you be like, where you at, Dre? I'm in the gym, I'm in the gym. I'm like, oh, Jamal, uh, all you got to do is this. All you got, even though you still tell me that now, do this, do this. And then I'm like, well, where you at? What you doing? We would FaceTime each other. And you was like in the gym, like lifting. Eh, or, mm-hmm. uh, I never did that. Uh, I never did, you did any But you was like, uh, eh, never eh. Did or that. But you was on the floor like, eh. Never. Like always, right? So Absolutely pretty much not. you always been very physically fit, really buff. At your highest, what was what did you what was you pushing? Uh I would say I was Is about, it called lifting? I was about 190. I was benching 315. You was benching 315, meaning if you had a human on you. No, it's chest. So that's laying down. You laying down. Push so if a human being was you could push him up off you, yeah. up and down, if yeah. he weighed 315 pounds. Yes. Wow. Squatting, squatting, uh, about four hundred pounds. Uh, four hundred pounds. And deadlifting about three fifteen. I squat thirty five pounds. Oh no, <laughs> no, no, no. Why are you laughing at me? I, I wasn't. Uh, I was laughing. I'm just. I'm what? happy about life. Oh. Yep. I'm so happy to be here. Okay. No, no, no. But wait, well, hold on, huh? I was gonna say that's the bar in the back that I squat. Right. But both sides is thirty five, so I'm really squatting seventy. Right. 70, yeah. Yeah, which is closer great. to 400. And that is great. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're doing good. All right, now that's what I wanted to know. All right, so boom, you strong, you successful, you huge. But then one day, you I called you, you called me because you was in Germany. And you said to me, we're we going to hit the boom, but you said to me, um, I said, what you doing? You said, I'm eating KFC. I said, why are you eating KFC? You was like, shh, Dre. You was like, I haven't been, I haven't been eating. You said, I think it's, I've been trying to eat. That's what you told me. You said, but I think the food has so many preservatives or whatever they got in it that it's just messing up my stomach. You was like, and I, I, I literally can't like, like I, I can't eat that food on base. So now I'm just like using my money. I'm overspending and I'm just eating everything every day off base. Because like I'm losing weight and my stomach is hurting. So okay. that was our conversation. Yep. So I'm like, oh, okay. You know, you introduced me to who you were sitting with, whatever. So that was the thing. So from time to time, of course, we check in. I love you. I send you a love. Okay, I love you. This, that, and I want to write you. Nope, don't write me yet because I didn't get here yet. You know, you was real strict with us about the rules. Don't do this yet. Don't do that. I'm not, it's going to get lost. Again. So then all of a sudden, I'm just going to tell y'all on March the 30th, 2023, I get a call at 3.23 a.m. I get this call, middle of the night, you know, as a mother, you when that phone ring in the middle of the night, everything drops through to your toes. Like, you know, you, you instantly wake up, even though my phone is on vibrate, okay? So I wake up and it's a call from Jamal. So you call me and you like, Dre, and I'm like, what, what, what's going on? And you said, I'm in the hospital. You go ahead, I'm gonna cry too. I'm not gonna cry. Oh, I'm gonna cry. You said, I'm in the hospital. 
and they just found all these tumors in my body. I'm like, what? I'm like, what you want? What are you talking? What? So I get up. I'm like, huh? And you go look because you had me on FaceTime. Mm -hmm. And you said, Dre. And all I could, all I could see in that moment was that little boy. <laughs> just that little boy, like a little face, like this masculine man. And, and I'm not talking about, you know, how you presented yourself because you presented yourself as a man. But for me, you know, as a as a mom, God mom, because I will always give respect to Tony, your mother. But as a mom, I'm like, I could just see this little boy. And you was like, your face, Lord Jesus, every time I could think about it. I try not to. But you said, they, they found all these tumors in my body. And they think it's, they think it's cancer. Mm-hmm. I said, Jamal, no. So I go downstairs and I cut on all the lights and I'm like, what? I got a bonnet on my head to the side. All the yeah, because all the lights, because I need attention. I got to <laughs> see everything. No glasses, just probably coal in my eye, everything, whatever, twisted bonnet. And I'm like, what? And you laid in that bed in that room and you said, Dre, you said the doctor is going to call you because he wants to tell you, you know, what's going on. I said, Jamal, it can't be. What are you talking about? You said, Dre, I lost. I don't know if you told me 35 pounds. I lost 40 pounds in two weeks. So go ahead. Tell your story. Yeah. Um, so it's a it's a story to the story. Um. We uh, ended up in Europe. We were at uh, Grafenwehr, Germany. Um, I got there. I went a little bit earlier than everybody else, kind of got everything set up. Um, and we got a, a mission set that I won't talk about because I don't know how public it is at this point. But uh, it, we started running really hard. Um, every day was a, uh, I'm already a 4 o'clock, 4 a.m. gym guy. I'm in the gym at 4 a.m., uh, from four to six, I work out by myself. I do PT with my soldiers from six thirty to seven forty-five, and then I'm at work from nine until finish. Um, and so we we running hard. We building ranges. We getting vehicles. We getting our vehicles good. We doing all these things. And through all of that, um, I was starting to have some stomach issues. But again can do attitude. Uh, it's probably just a stomach bug. You know, what I'm eating, just got here. Whatever. I'll deal with it in due time. Y'all remember? Okay. Remember his mother? Absolutely. I'll just deal with it on my own. Remember his wrist? I'll just deal with it on my own. Okay, here we go again. It's playing yep. out again. I'll just deal with it on my own. Lord Jesus. Yep. And so um, I started to see people that hadn't seen me in a couple of weeks and they said, hey, you okay? And I'm like, yeah, why do you say that? And they'd be like, you look sick. And I didn't understand what they were saying because when you deploy, there's no mirrors. So you're not walking past a mirror all the time. Um, uh, you just, you know, we was living 40 to a bay. Everything was real tight. And I was very focused on work. You know, it was just a lot of things going on that just needed to get done. And so um, as, as a man that is a sole provider in my household, my number one job is to take care of my family. And so for me, I focused very, you know, I had a very tight shot group when it came to work. Um, I always wanted to be loved and respected and appreciated at work because whenever my family came around, I wanted them to see how much love and dedication I put into work because that's what I'm pouring into them. I wanted them to understand that, but from other people. Um, and so I was just so busy working. And one day, uh, my commander at the time, uh, Captain Escobar, we were having a conversation and she said, you are going to go see the medics today because I started falling asleep in the middle of middle of meetings, which is nothing like me. Um, I am the, the can do guy. We've been up for 24 hours. It's fine. Eat some candy and we're going to figure this out and we'll sleep when we're done. Lord. Um, and she stopped me in my tracks and she said, you are going to go to see the medics today. So I'm like, all right, cool, whatever. So I go see the medics. Uh, they do a blood test, a urine test. And, um, 
check my vitals or whatever. And they like, yeah, the, once the results come back, they like, yeah, you got some, uh, you got some, your liver enzymes are high. So it's something going on in your liver, but you'll be all right. Um, and they, they came back in the blood work that I was anemic. And so me can do attitude. I go to the PX, the post exchange. I go get me some B12 vitamins, some iron. I go get me all these things to try to help this, uh, this deficiency that I'm having. Cause I'm like, well, maybe that's why I'm tired. Mm-hmm. Um, and a couple of days later, I started to feel worse to the point where I wasn't able to really stand up at work. Uh, it got really bad, really fast. Um, and I was, um, I was, I was, uh, while she crying, I'm gonna make a joke. I was Don't trying to fight. I was trying to fight cancer with B12 vitamins. Mm. Uh, I had no idea. So I go back to the medics. Now they send me, I get blood work done again and a stool, uh, stool sample, but they say everything's normal. And so I'm like, well, maybe I'm just being weak. Maybe I'm, you know, upset. I'm missing my family. And maybe I'm just allowing myself to have a moment of weakness. And so I continue to drive on. Uh, They tell me that they're going to give me an appointment for a GI doctor. It was March at the time. And they told me I could go see the GI doctor in July. Jesus. And so I bust out laughing because for me, I'm always like, I'm not going to the hospital. They don't know what they're doing or whatever, whatever. And so I go back to work and I'm like, giving everybody a tongue lash and like, you wanted me to go and see the medics? This is what they told me to do. I got to wait two months. I got to deal with it anyway. You should just shut up, whatever. Um, but what, in a, and this is why I will always tell people that God is present um, and, and at all times and at the right time specifically. We had a soldier that had a, a injury that he had to go to a place called Landstuhl for in Germany. <laughs> It's the big hospital. That's where all the doctors are, like the actual doctors, not medics. We're talking about actual doctors, um, you know. And so uh, they're like, hey, he needs to go to the hospital. We need somebody to take him. It was a four-hour drive. And so they're like, we need somebody to take him. And um, we need somebody to take him. And I wasn't volunteering because I just got cursed out the other day because they said I'm never around because I'm always doing other things. And they need me around more to do my actual job. I was doing my actual job and probably four other jobs at the time. Um, but again, can't do attitude. We just got to get it done, right? So uh, the soldier comes in at night while I'm in my bed. Um, and he asked me, hey, Sergeant Salam, are you going to take me to the hospital? And I rolled over and I told him if he didn't get away from my bed, I was going to punch him in the nose. 100%. Oh, okay. Because uh, he was frustrating me. But... I felt that that was a call from God at that time. Like, mm-hmm. no, you need to get up and you Lord. need to do this. Jesus. Um, and mm. so uh, his appointment was at seven, maybe. Uh, the hospital was four hours away. So uh, we left uh, We left Grafenvir and route to Longstool. So you got up and took him? At 2.30 in the morning. Mm. Uh, I currently still have that alarm because I feel like that alarm saved my life. Um, so we dropped in Longstool again. He drives halfway and he gets tired. And he says, hey, sorry, can you drive the rest? Absolutely not. But I do it. Right. Um, and I get there and now, mind you, I don't have an appointment. So I'm sitting in the parking lot and I'm like, do I go in or do I not? Because I feel like I'm, you know, right now, I just feel like I'm not pushing myself. And I think that all of my old my old trauma came up. Of, Are you feeling bad for yourself? Do you just not want to go through this adversity? But something just wasn't right because I'm very in touch with my body. Um, at that time, prior to going to, to Germany, I was pescatarian, so I wasn't eating meat to avoid um, all of the you know things that they put in their meat now to make them grow and all of this kind of stuff. And so I was just eating seafood, uh, vegetables, and fruits because also I'm working out a lot. And so your body is going to get the uh, nutrients and uh, minerals, whatever you need, it's going to get it faster from fish because it fish and vegetables and fruits because they break it down faster. Um, so I gave up meat. Um, and so I decide, um, cause well, you really sitting in the parking lot and like you said, now your trauma is facing you yeah. that old, that family of origin stuff of, absolutely. I could just handle this on my own. I could figure it out. Or God is whispering and saying, go up in there and talk to the doctors, go up in there and talk to somebody who is fucking yep. medically trained. Absolutely. 
Uh, but the thing is, this is when I realized that I had grown. I understood that it wasn't my fight no more. Mm. And I came here for a reason. And I was I was mature enough and I was masculine enough. And I'm going to say that because a lot of times we think masculine is this big thing. It's this tough thing. But sometimes being masculine is being able to say, I got to put this down. Yeah, oh, that's good. Um, and so at that moment, you I put said, it down. at that moment, I said, I'm going to give it to God. Okay. And, um, you know, if I do need to see a GI doctor, because again, you know, I had a plan to retire at 20 years and make all this money because I'm retired. And if, you know, at that point, I didn't give in 20 years of my life to this country. Um, but I've also sacrificed so much for my family. You know, at that time, it was going to be time for me to give back to my family. At 42, I wanted to be a, a stay home dad. And I just wanted to yell at my son for not getting straight A's. Oh, so check this out. This That's good because we didn't even say your age. So you're a 31 year old male 31 year old man male healthy as an ox healthy is an ox healthy as an ox 190 pounds 190 pounds bench pressing bench pressing 315 okay. running running a five mile in under 40 minutes and in this moment you had lost in two weeks you lost how much 40? lost 40 pounds lord jesus 40 pounds so you had the emergency room doors. You're sitting outside. Yep. You got your soldier inside. So you make the decision, thank the Lord, to go in there. Absolutely. And to go through the emergency room Absolutely. for your stomach. Yep. Uh, walk in the emergency room. Uh, get a mask because uh, you still wear a mask at the time. Mm -hmm. See the lady at the front desk. Give her my ID card. I'll check in. Uh, they get me in the back. They're like, what's the issue? I'm like, I'm having some uh, some stomach issues. Um, I don't really know what's going on, but they told me I can't see the GI doctor until July. So if this is an emergency, he's here, I'm here. And if this emergency, excuse me, he's going to have to see me now. Um, that was my train of thought. I'm thinking about a GI doctor. Mm -hmm. Um, so I get a, I give a urine sample. I do a blood test and, um, same elevated en enzymes come back and there's this uh there's the emergency room doctor he says send him for a cat scan because i want to rule something out um and i go for the cat scan me and the nurse we click he from new york city so you know we trash talking and you know we just <laughs> we having a good time because um, you're not even thinking no. that you're not even thinking it's not even on the radar that you're going to get this diagnosis. Okay. It's not even on the radar. And so um, I go get the CAT scan. Ten minutes later, he comes in the room. He opens the door, puts his head in the door, looks at me, and then closes the door. Very weird. I almost called security. And um, I decided not to. So I Good. just sat there and I waited. Uh -huh. And the nurse comes in and the doctor comes back in. And me and the nurse had been vibing. You know, it was good vibes. We was laughing, talking about food. I told him he sucked because he's from New York, you know, whatever. And um, he's very serious. Like, his face straight, almost like dark-skinned guy. He almost looked like a little pale. Like, he looked scared. And I was like, this is very weird. So, again, I'm thinking about calling security, fight or flight mode at this point. Uh, and I don't want to fight nobody. And so the doctor comes in, and he's asking me all these questions and finally, he goes, the last question, which is very off topic for the, the line of question that he was given. He says, do you have a family history of cancer? And I'm like, no, my grandmother had colon cancer or whatever. But I'm like, no, whatever. So he's like, all right, cool. Just give me a few minutes. But when he was leaving out, I was like, whoa, what are you trying to say? Like, <laughs> This is a little weird. Mm -hmm. I was like, I'm a straightforward guy. I need you to say whatever you got to say. And he flat out looks me in my face and says, you have cancer. And so initial, my initial, uh, you know, I think that a lot of times we think like, I will respond to this this way. I had no response mm. initially because uh, I was confused. I was like, what? I laughed because I'm like. It's called shock. Dude, I, it's no way I have cancer because that. Up leading up until this point, I'm still going to the gym at four o'clock in the morning. I'm still shoulder pressing seventies. I'm 140 pounds, but I'm shoulder pressing seventies. I'm still strong, and I'm like, there's no way that um, that I have cancer. So I'm like, all right, I'm just gonna let this play out. So it gets worse because he comes back with a, uh, I forgot what they're called, but he comes back with the doctor from upstairs. 
And he looks me dead in my face again and says, you have cancer. We found cancer in your liver. It's all over your liver. This is bad. Like, he, he's like, I don't even know what to say to you. Um, he was like, I'm, you know, I'm, uh, he told me you were a straight shooter. I said, absolutely. And I appreciate the honesty. I said, I need to make a phone call. Um, at this point, I think, like Dre said, it's shock. And so I'm still army. Like my mind is, all right, I got to call my, uh, I got to call my, uh, my command team. I let them know, like, these are the first people I call them. Like, Hey, I got, you know, uh, I'm getting admitted to the hospital. They think I got cancer. And so they like, what? But they like, all right, cool. We're going to send it up. And now it hits me a little bit because now I have to call somebody. I have to let somebody in my family know what's going on. And, you know, when it comes to the army, you know, you business minded, you love everybody, but it's mission first. Mm. And, um, but with your family, again, like Dre says, they don't look at you as you've become this thing, this walking tank, as if, you know, you want to call it. They don't look at you like you, you're a problem solver. You're this big, strong person. They see you as when you were a child sitting in a car seat. Um, and my godmother, well, I call my now wife who, uh, gets on my nerves to the seventh Leave her alone. Power. Leave her alone. That's my girl. Uh, she <laughs> obviously does not answer the phone. <laughs> I'm dying at this point. She doesn't answer the phone. And so I know the second person that I have to call is my godmother because that's that's my girl. That's my that's my person. And uh, But I'm, you know, I'm thinking about it and I'm like, I really don't want to call her because I don't know uh, how she can respond to this. And so uh, I get on the phone and I find enough goal to call her. And I'm like, hey, uh, I got cancer. I'm like, I don't really know nothing because I haven't really been listening to them. Like, I don't I don't even know what they're saying, but the doctor's going to call you. He's going to let you know what's up. And the, the conversation is very matter of fact. He, like it was. It's very like, hey, this is what it is. This is what's happening. Because I, and like she said, I think I was in shock. I had... I had no idea what to do. I didn't know what, you know. So call her, uh, my godfather, if anybody knows her husband, he is the most emotionless man <laughs> you ever met. But um, when I called, he sat up out the bed um, and was like all in the phone. And, you know, that's when I realized like th this probably is a little serious because he usually doesn't react to anything. <laughs> um, and so... Uh, I finally get on the phone with my wife. I talk to her. I let her know. Very matter of fact, again, hey, I got cancer. Um, I don't know much because I'm I'm not really listening to them and I'm not smart enough to know these words, but the doctor is going to call you and he's going to explain it to you. I felt that it was best that the doctor call them and give them all the information that he could as opposed to me uh, misstating something or saying something that was wrong because in my mind, I'm still trying to, I'm trying to soften this up. I'm trying to soften uh the blow for them, if you will. Um, I needed, I needed them to be okay. I needed them to know that at that moment I wasn't panicking yet. Uh, I tried to keep myself under control because I wanted to manage everybody else's emotions. Lord. Um, and I wanted to manage their emotions, but I just needed them to know that, um, the first thing I did when I got diagnosed was I gave this thing to God. Um, because our, our fights are not ours to fight. Um, and we go back to, again, God had been preparing me my whole life for this fight. Oh, my God. Um, and so I knew at that time it was time for me to give it to God because it was nothing I could do about this. Like, I didn't know how to react. I didn't know what to say. Um, there's not a lot of information out there. Like, you you didn't get on Google. How do I react to getting diagnosed with cancer? And nothing came up. So I had no idea what to do. And um, I stayed still for probably about two weeks. I didn't really have any emotion towards anything. I didn't I didn't know how to feel. And so I think I didn't allow myself to feel mm -hmm. because I had to I had to stay in control because I didn't mm -hmm. want them trying to fly to Germany. I needed them to know I can handle this right now. Um and it was looking back it was I was in a bad place. I was in a you, horrible place. You was in I'm sure you was you had to have been in a bad yeah. place. I mean, yeah. for anybody, but you know, to your point, you know how you would imagine somebody else that had just gotten his diagnosis. You would imagine, and if even even if it were you, that you'd be hysterical, like what, and crawling on the floor and screaming. 
and you that was not your like you said it like it was nothing like you you had a moment yeah. if we're gonna be real 100 yeah, percent. but be real. It, with, with me you had a moment yeah, 15 30 seconds it was yeah it wasn't even it yeah. honest to god i don't even think it got the 30 seconds <laughs> But, it, but, the, but you the had moment, a little quick moment. That moment wasn't even for me. I felt bad saying it to, to Dre. What you That moment when I cried, I didn't. I wasn't upset for me. I was upset that I had to tell you that. What do you mean? What do you mean? Um, you know, I had, I had gotten so used to. Um, coming with good news i'm getting promoted having a baby i'm making good money i bought a house you know that me having to say that to you because i knew what it was gonna do to you <clears throat> Excuse, let me get myself together uh i knew what it was gonna do to you i knew how you were gonna feel uh and i knew that you was gonna feel powerless in the situation because i was in europe so even if you wanted to get up in that moment and drive or get up in that moment and get on a flight you couldn't um and so that moment wasn't, it wasn't for me. I wasn't crying for myself. I had already been diagnosed. It was what it was. It was nothing I could do for myself in that moment. Um, you know, they're not going to start chemo that day. They won't start radiation that day. They won't start medicine that day. It, it was nothing I could do for myself. But I felt bad having to say that because I knew that I was, you know, kind of shifting the weight. I was giving some of my weight to, to you and to everybody else. But and, and it had to happen. It had to happen. And it's okay. But in that moment, I just felt, I didn't, I didn't want to. I didn't want to, I needed to tell you, but I didn't want to. And so it was hard for me. It, was, it wasn't It was hard for me to hear it. Because um, for me, I'm going to accept whatever, and I'm going to do what I got to do. But it was hard for me to say to you, you know, I'm in a bad place right now. And you know what you said? <sighs> you said, and I'm alone. Mm-hmm. Yep, I was by myself. You said, Dre, they just diagnosed me with this. And at that time, it was like, this is what they think, but it wasn't like a hardcore diagnosis. And then yeah. you said to me, which is what I was feeling, you said, and I'm alone. Oh, my God, that just ripped my soul to pieces. Yeah. Because if I could have been there, it would have been there. Yeah. And I, and I knew that. And I knew that. I think that's why I cried because I didn't want you to, you know, you've always been there. And so I know I knew that you not being able to be there was going to cause a, you know, there was a thing. But I think that me kind of just being in this moment where I'm like, hey, this is what it is. I think it just softened it a little bit because I felt like I didn't place you in a state of panic because I was panicking. I think that- Yeah, you, know, you wasn't panicking. Yeah, I think that you understood that it was like, okay, this is bad, but it's, he's okay. You know, you could be in a, it's okay to not be okay. Right. Well, you know, you know what? You know what? Um, I will say this, right? I mean, for me, right? Just like, I think for me, just the person that I am, right? And mm -hmm. how I respond to trauma and tragedy, you know, as a psychotherapist, right? Um, I probably have a different way of looking at things, yeah. right? Um, and like connection, like to God, just how I see connection to God and our purpose for being here. But I will say to you right now in this moment that you said that, um, I did, I wasn't hysterical at that moment. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, what helped me probably was that you wasn't hysterical because mm -hmm. had you been like, <laughs> like crying and rolling all over the bed and shit out. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, literally, I would have been screaming, Tariq, we got to get out of here. Get us to, yeah. like, so that probably would have. So the fact that, yeah, like, we stayed in constant communication. You know, you kept me updated. Like, you know, you gave me permission to speak to all the doctors and the doctors, because you know me, I went into go all mode. All in the business. Like <laughs> all in the business. She telling the doctors what y'all need to do. <laughs> like, you know, like, you know, so that it was honestly, now that you say that, Molly, like the fact that you weren't hysterical. Yeah. Cause like you said, I don't even know if that little cry lasted 30, 30 seconds. Okay. Yeah. And then you was kind of like matter of fact, and you kept me updated. Like you could literally talk to me, we could talk. And so 
That probably did help me yeah, until it was, uh, it was business. I, you I, got to me. Yeah, it was business. Or, well, I got to you, but we met up. What was that? Two weeks after that. Yeah, and so, um, so okay, so I get the diagnosis. Boom. Um, uh, I don't want to stay too long in this again. But, yeah, go know. ahead. Just um, go where you want to go. Excuse me, but I meet this. I meet this guy. Um, I get contacted. My my unit chaplain signs me up for Wounded Warrior Program, and I meet this guy. And at this point, I'm tired of talking to people. Um, the highest the highest enlisted uh, ranking person in my battalion. As soon as he found out I got diagnosed with cancer, he was there. Meant so much to me. Uh, Commander Sergeant Major Thacker from 163 Armor, uh, great guy. Um, Drove up that night and was there for with me and for me until I left the hospital. Four hours. Um, all the platoon sergeants in my organization, Sergeant First Class Valvano, uh, Sergeant Wheeler, uh, Captain Escobar, Sergeant Sly, uh, they uh, they all came up to see me and they came up with the unit chaplain. And they, uh, you know, just we, we fast forward, but they bought the chaplain and the chaplain's, I'm in there making jokes. <laughs> yeah, I, this is all a joke to me at this point because who gets cancer? Like I'm in the middle of my life. I'm 31. Yes. Thriving. <laughs> what, what is going thriving, on? Thriving. Thriving. And so now it becomes a joke. Um, and so we laughing and my commander's in the corner crying uh, because she just, she can't take none of this. And so the unit chaplain, he comes and he's like, y'all brought me up here to talk to him. Like he thinks this is a game, but it's genuine. Like he's good. And I was, I was in a good space because I felt love. Um, I felt love from, from my support system that I had from my family and I felt love from my support system at the army. Very thankful for that. And that's why I wanted to say their names because it's uh, it was very important to me. Uh, they were great uh, and still are great to this day. Um, but I'm, he signed me up for Wounded Warrior Program and I meet this guy. Well, this, this young lady contacts me and she's talking to me and I'm like, yeah. She's like, oh, we're going to come see you today. I was like, yeah, okay. I really don't want you to, but whatever. And with her comes this guy his name is uh his name is Will. Uh, his last name is escaping me, and I'm so sorry. Uh, Will works for Wounded Warrior, and he's from Brooklyn. Um, and so me and her are having a conversation. He just jumps in the conversation. You, you from Jersey? Yeah, and you're from Brooklyn. I'm sorry. You know, we we have the conversation. We're going back and forth. We arguing about who pizza is better. You know, regular stuff. And um, you know, I, I think nothing of nothing of it. I just met this guy, great guy. I'm, I run into great people all the time. You know, I like to rub. Uh, elbows are good people. I think God does that. You just, you know, you, you attract the energy that you are. Um, great guy, great guy. Um, so fast forward in, I do all these tests, whatever. Um, and it's time for me to get transferred from Europe to, um, from Europe to where I'm going to start my treatment at, at, uh, Fort Sam Houston, Texas. Uh, at this point I find out I have stage four cancer. At, uh, I had no idea that, um, so cancer goes from stages one through four. It usually takes about two to three years to go from stage one to stage four. Um, and so my, I had been fighting cancer with no drugs. I had no idea. All of these things that we talked about that I accomplished, mm. I was fighting cancer Lord and I had no Jesus. idea. Um, but again, the, the tools that God put in my bag allowed me to carry on the life decisions that I made, you know, exercising, running. I was running 13 and a half miles every other day and seven on the days I wasn't running 13 miles. And, um, you know, I was just so focused on life and living because I had finally found my foothold at 29 years old and I was thriving mm -hmm. and I just wanted to be in it. But you know, I didn't really have any real symptoms of what you would think cancer is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you think mm -hmm. cancer is going to sit you down. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, but I didn't. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so for two, for two to three years, while this cancer was going from stage one to stage four, no medication, no nothing. I'm going to my regular doctor visits and they like, Hey, you good. Mm. Um, because if you don't specific, specifically test for cancer, it's not going to come up on a regular uh, blood test panel. Mm. Um, and so, I meet this guy, Will, it's time for me to go home and, you know, start my chemo. And he's like, I want your family to be there with you. Now, 
Andre and Sean Brown are already gearing up to like they like yeah we driving out there we come in we'll see you can when we, you get there can we drive to oh yeah 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 I'm like can yeah. we drive to Germany though yeah. we'll see you when you get there we gonna be there you know I know they gonna be oh, there oh oh right 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 oh I get it not the Germany you yeah, talking to about Texas right 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 because now wait, right because now they made this your the army has made this uh, emergency decision yep. to say immediately this is how we figured out it was stage four because before then we didn't really know right. so they're like no this is stage four and i think it's important to say what your scan showed that it was in your what three organs liver, your liver lungs your lungs and colon and in your colon yep. right and so at three places okay yep. and so they were like you need to come home you did you you got to go now like yeah. you need that doctor when he came back on Monday, right? Mm -hmm. The hospital said, "Oh no, 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 ain't no, because they was gonna send you back to base, and you was gonna no, send him home now." And so then that's when you on your way to Texas, and so a quick admin note: I okay. was I was about two weeks away from not being able to receive chemotherapy. So um, they would have sent me home and told me, "Hey, this is your diagnosis, and that's it for you." Um, and I would I pretty much would have just been waiting to die. Lord. Um, and so I am. 100% thankful for any day past March 30th because I could have died in Europe. I could have never seen my son again. I could have never seen my wife again. I could have never seen anybody that I wanted to see again. And I would have died doing what I thought was important, which was providing for my family. Mm. And, I, and I'm going to be honest, I would have been 100% okay with that. Um, in, in my spirit and in my feelings, I wouldn't have been, but I, I would have known that's, that's how I would have wanted to go. Um, I what you mean? I would I would have been okay, you know. For me, it's just you know, um, I always wanted to be a dad, but I never wanted to be a dad. I wanted to be a daddy, and daddy is the affectionate term for me. You call it, you know, daddy is like you know you love that guy, and so for me, I was okay with my son knowing that I left to provide a life for him and his mother. And that something happened, a complication happened, and it ended my life. And I would have been okay with that because that was my priority at the time. At that time, in that moment, before I got cancer and I started to understand the bigger things in life, providing was my number oh, one. I'm with you. I'm tracking. Providing because was I wasn't... my number one thing. And okay. so I would have been okay mm -hmm. if I couldn't. You know, had I closed my eyes and we didn't know mm -hmm. and I just didn't wake up. And I would have woke up somewhere else and actually, you know, had a presence of mind. I would have said, I died doing what I love most. Okay, so you're talking about, um, let's say if you was at war. Yes. And if something happened in the army or whatever, for you felt like death would have been purposeful. It's, it's fine. Yeah, because I'm just going to let y'all know, we also had issue with him going back to, because he was in recruit and doing well. And then he decided to go back and to deploy. Right. Mm -hmm. And we were all this. So this was in last, this was November. Yep. And you said, Nope, I'm going to do it. Dre. Like we, and I'm like, Jamal, because uh, we didn't say this, but you have a, a two year old son. Yep. So you had a two year old son. Yeah, my life and my yes. Son. And his wife. And I'm like, Jamal, you can't like, no, you got to stay. Nope, Dre. And he was uber focused on this, um, this goal that he had because he had a goal of retiring at a certain time. He wanted to make a certain money to provide for his family. Um, um, and like for schooling and everything. So he had this goal. He had tunnel vision. And he wasn't listening. So, okay, anywho, yeah, so I get it. So that's what you're saying. So, but through that process, mm -hmm. then March the 30th, right? Yep. After that November deployment was when you get this crazy diagnosis, which yep. brings us back to here. And so now you're saying it's time for you to come get some treatment. Oh, absolutely. Please go get treatment. That's absolutely. what that doctor said. Get him out of here. Yep. Which was, you know, even and in, in you was talking about uh, Tariq and I saying we was about to drive because you were talking about Will with Wounded Warrior. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they t gave you your place with you, where you'd have treatment was in San Antonio, Texas. We're in Texas. We like when, what day? Because we want to be there. And see, because at this moment, you ain't got to tell us to ce celebrate you and be there when you deploy. Like, this is. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Party now. <laughs> now you can. <laughs> 
<laughs> we didn't know about. Well, we didn't now need I'm to, not coming back. <laughs> I can't with you. We didn't need to know about the culture and what was supposed to, because we just knew like our son was sick and I don't care how we, we need to get to him, touch him, take care of him. I mean, we even told you come home, like come to the house, come to the house. Yeah. And, and I will tell you, I probably should let you, 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 oh, you wouldn't care. But um, I said to him and my husband, Tariq, his godfather said at the time, like, no, he need to come here. Like get, bring him to this house. Why would he go there? Like, let him come in and get treatment here. And I'm like, yeah, Jamal, come here. Like you could stay here. Today. And he's like, yeah, he's like, he would he, what you say? You said something like um, when I was, when I was a kid, he said, yeah, when I was a kid, you know, and y'all would always keep offering for me to come this. I was running from there, whatever. Yeah. Now I do want to come there, but I got a whole family that right. I need to bring with too me. Too many people. Too many people need too much space. <laughs> it's, it's a lot going on. I said, bring them to, bring them to, come on, we're going to do this. Yeah. So, um, okay. So then you have this crazy flight. Okay, but just just oh, real quick, go you got to highlight Will. Oh, yeah, Will, please. Will steps in and says, yes. I want your family to come see you. So I'm like, okay, whatever. Um, and he says, no, but we are going to pay for it. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> you got for me? And so he's like, yeah, we want to pay for your family to fly. Now, I'm I'm super uncomfortable with that. Like, I'm like, no, like, we are we making our own arrangements. He's like, no, this is what this is here for. You are going to let me fly your godparents and the mother of your child mm -hmm. and your child, I'm going to fly them to Texas. Wow. They're going to Texas. And I'm like, okay. So I write it off. He says, give me your godmother's number. So I give Will her number and Will reaches out to my godmother and I wake up in the morning and she's telling me that he booked flights and uh, Will was Will was amazing and he was a breath of fresh air. He really took a lot off of my shoulders because we didn't have to find flight arrangements for everybody who wanted to be there for me. At the yeah, time. but listen, not only Will, it was also so Evan comes in later. Yeah, Evan but... come. Will was the initial push, and then he sent it to Evan, and then Evan was the one that reached out. Um, because so let me just say this: let's get it all clear. Yeah. I never spoke to Will. Oh, okay. Yeah, I no, know. I know because you was sick, right? Oh, With God. your you <laughs> So I never spoke to Will. Okay. I spoke to Evan. Right. So Evan was the one who called me, but when he called me, because he was like, yeah, you know, this is going on with Jamal. You know, we know that he's coming here. He was like, um, so uh, are you guys planning on coming? I'm like, absolutely. Whatever time, like we going to be there. Whenever he touches ground, we're going to be there. And so he was like, well, listen, he made connections with my boss my boss will and he said and through their connections will told me that you guys don't have to worry about a thing he said so nope don't you drive he said don't i said you sure i said no we good and my husband in the background shut up and listen to him he said he go he gonna take it <laughs> <laughs> i'm like i'm like no we good like we getting ready to drive down there and so he was like uh no 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 uh-uh you don't have to drive he said we're gonna we're gonna fly you down you and your husband he said and when you get here we're gonna provide you a rental car he said and we're going to provide you a place to stay while you here. As long as you here and you taking care of him because he needs you here and support is important. We're going to take care of it. And he said, this came from, from my boss, Will. Will, Will and Evan were invaluable and still are. Oh me. my gosh. Um, uh, freaking yeah, amazing. They've become, they become family for me. Um, amazing. Um, amazing support. Shakima, which is my wife. Missed her flight and he booked another flight. Yes. It was crazy, but they made sure that I had uh my support system and was yes, in they place. Did. Um and yes, they it was did. it was amazing because I didn't I didn't want to see anybody. But when I did see them, I kinda um, you know, it after not seeing my son for six months, it was already emotional for me. But you know, coming back and having this diagnosis, I'm like, all right, cool. Like I have to start to calm down and let people help and you know, and so Will and Evan, Will and Evan, thank you so much. Uh, Will and Evan thank you so much. Uh, were uh, were and still are invaluable in, in this process, and I'm I'm so thankful for them and for Wounded Warrior for uh, helping us get together. But boom, okay, so every we skipping forward, everybody's here, and um, 
you know, so we doing our family thing. We we eat it. We having a good time. We laughing. It's almost like I don't even got cancer at this point. No, listen, um, nope. Uh uh-uh. uh. For me. For him. For me. And this is what's so interesting. We talked about this yesterday. It's his perspective. Where he was and where we were was totally different. Everything was a joke for me. So for point. him, because because that's his defense mechanism. Yeah. But for us, hell no. We were acting like it was okay because it was, and God says it's so. And we are here, but trust me, like, you know, we getting by ourselves. We like, what the just scared, scared, literally shitless, like scared shitless. And that's just the truth. That's for all of us, his wife, um, my husband, and for me. And I'm sure for all of your other family, but I don't think everybody else even knew yet. Right. Well, we didn't even know what to do, how to pull it. But anywho, he's saying we was chilling. We were chilling because that's what we do. But no, on the inside, we was like this. I had no idea it was coming. <laughs> He was like this. He didn't see it, but we did it every day. I had no idea. <laughs> um, so from from there, uh, I got a chemo port placed in, um, and I started my first chemo treatment, which were they, they were there for. Um, so they saw me go through my first chemo treatment. They discharged me from the hospital. Um, and again, here come Will and Evan. They get me a, uh, a Fisher house down at uh, <laughs> Fort Sam Houston, bathroom, bedroom, living room. They give me an iPad, like they, like you want a PlayStation. You got like, you got a Yankee hat and a Yankee shirt. A Yankee hat, a Yankee shirt. They buy me like all of this stuff. It's crazy. So um, nice. And so they they take care of me while I'm there. And at this point, after they fly, now my godparents and my wife, everybody have to leave because um, one of the things that I think that sometimes we don't realize is you dealing with something, but life is still moving. Mm. Um, and so everybody had to go back to work. And so again. Um, I had to be okay with being by myself, kind of. But my godparents made a way. They were, um, when one wasn't there, the other one was there. Um, they came down, they bought food, they bought love, they bought support, um, which were which were probably the things that I needed at that time uh, because I started to go. Uh, this is when I started to understand what was coming. Mm. Um, I didn't. I still didn't know. But we're not gonna again. We're not gonna stay in that too long. I was having some really bad symptoms, but my my thing was I wanted to get home. I wanted to be with my son. I wanted to be with my wife. I I needed to start to figure out, um, you know, this this thing as is something that I equated to how I deal with death. You never really, in, in my opinion, um, in my unprofessional opinion, because I'm not credentialed. Don't listen to me. Uh, but but listen to him. But listen to me because I'm have a platform right now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, you, I don't think you ever really stop grieving. I think that when you lose somebody that you love or you deal with an extreme situation that changes the course of your life, you you never get over it. You never get closure. But you just have to learn to start living your new life. And I was ready to start living my new life with this this disability that I had because I didn't know what it meant and I didn't know how it was gonna affect my family. So I'm gonna come in here. Come on. Because- Come on with the therapy. <laughs> it's not <laughs> therapy, it's, it's my truth. So um, that, uh, was it two weeks in San Antonio? Yeah. So that two weeks in San Antonio was a lot of, whole bunch of, Uh, We had peaks because we were together and we had good times, but it was a whole bunch of valleys. It was a very, very, very dark time. It was a very dark time Um, for Jamal. Yes, absolutely. But also for us, but two different perspectives. But uh, yeah, I actually saw, I witnessed Jamal going through depression at the time. He probably will say, well, at first he would fight me on this because his depression for him, and I think that this is important, is people, I think when you, you think depression looks or feels a certain way, yeah. but that that depression looks different ways. So, you know, when like he said, you know, when at first I think he was numb, he was in shock, like, okay, I just got to do this. I'm in fight mode, right? We learning all these diagnoses. We learning about treatment. We learning 
prognosis, like what this looks like. We learning, you know, how for him, it was important, right? With his son and his wife, like, how long am I going to live? Like, you know, so we, we trying to think we learning all of this from, the, you know, the doctors and trying to make him feel as comfortable as possible, trying to feed him because he's just losing weight. So wherever he wants to eat, like we just trying to find a way we I'm popping up with stuff that we eat as a, that he would eat as a kid and probably was killing his stomach, but he didn't want to hurt my feelings. So he would just eat like we eating red lobster. We eating Cheddar Bay biscuits in the hospital. Like we eating soul food, whatever, right? Because we just tr really trying to connect the way we did before because we want him to feel loved and supported in food. In food uh. But um, however, after that initial shock, when you went to the Fisher house, you, I, I know you was depressed. I'm going clinically depressed, say you were. However, right? Um, you fought, you fought, and you allowed me to fight with you, you know, because um, half of the, the space, so, and when we would go down, we would take a blow-up bed, like whatever it was, and like he said, my husband would go on his days and work from there. I would go on my day, like we would flip back and forth, or sometimes we was there, so he could get through his treatment until he got back home. But um, I, I I will say that, that you were in the depression, because anytime, like when we were there, he, and I know a part of this is the symptoms of cancer, like bright lights are hurtful to his eyes, um, but he would really want to be in the dark. Like there was like, it was like an apartment that they had given him. And, you know, we had our little space out in the front and then I'd let him have his own room in the back. And he would just be in that, like a little squirrel in a hole. Like he would just go back in that room and have the TV. You know, one thing about Jamal, he would always have sports on in the background, just growing up. And he would have everything off and just be laying in his bed on his side. He was in a lot of pain and he would just want to be in that dark hole. So of course I come in there. I am not no dark hole kind of girl. She opened up the blind. She turned. I'm like, bro, what are you doing? <laughs> not on my watch, brother. Uh, uh. So this takes me back to when you was younger, and I was like, get the car, let's go, take yeah. me to work. <laughs> yeah. So I'm coming in there. I'm like, what you need me to cook? What you say you like? What you know? I don't want that drag. What you you said you want Cheesecake Factory? I'm like, get up. Put on your clothes. We going, come on, you going to stay here? You know, so I would push him because he would just lay in that bed in that hole. I'm like trying to, so I was like, listen, I'm going to let you be in the dark in the back. But up in the front, I'm like opening blinds and you would come out your hole sometime and come you out, laugh see. with us a little bit. <laughs> can't see because <laughs> bright lights everywhere. No, but I think that it's important to point out that depression is real and yeah. it makes sense. Why yeah. wouldn't it be depression, yeah, you and know? It, and, and probably not being in, in a depressed state at that time right. probably would have been more irregular right. than then it was, else. Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. And that's what I was trying to explain because we had argued about this. I wasn't depressed. I, Negro. Yes, you were. <laughs> <laughs> we gonna get in this car. Come on, we gonna take a ride. We gonna. Right. And you were tired. Remember, we went to the mall and stuff. She yeah. Walked me around the mall. <laughs> I'm, I'm actively receiving chemotherapy. But it was good for him. He Got was happy me in the mall. He was happy. He was Shocking. happy. <laughs> he was happy. He had to get out. We got to make a shift in that brain. Yeah, and absolutely. Then, and then, um, and and I will say this. So he sits here and says that he wanted you tell me something. I couldn't wait to get back home. That depression had you, baby, where you didn't want yeah. to go back home because I feel, and this is your story to tell, yeah. but that depression had you where you was like, Dre, I, I said, okay, you. I can't wait till you get home. You got, he has a beautiful home. I mean, it's immaculate. It's just delicious. His wife, his son. And I'm like, Jamal, okay, because I know, like, you got to get back home, you know, and you're going to feel good at home. And he was looking at me, Dre, on his pillow. He was like, no, Dre, I think, I don't know, like, I don't know about my care. That, like, he was making excuses about, like, his care and his treatment and his doctors. But it was really some fear, I believe, as to even what real life was going to look like oh, yeah. outside of that circumstance. Absolutely. I was, I was... <laughs> I was scared, like we said, I was scared shitless, yeah. but, but through that, yeah. I just, um, so my prognosis is two years that I, they gave me two years to live. And, uh, I started to feel a clock on my back that my son is two. And that means I may possibly not be here when he's four. And so now, now the emergency starts in my mind. I have to go home. Um, 
I got to go home. So I, I traveled from, I went from Texas to, uh, Maryland, went from Texas to Maryland. This is all on military flight. So I'm on a C-130, uh, they got hospital beds in there. So I'm like laying down, I got to get, uh, vitamins and nutrients and all this stuff through IV. Um, and then, um, I go from Maryland to, excuse me, I want to say I go from Maryland to Denver, Colorado, whatever. I go from Colorado to the, to Kansas. To Kansas. So I get to Kansas, boom. Um, and as much as we sat here and we done cried already and, um, you know, we done we done talked about some things that was really hard. My fight didn't start until I got home. Wow. Uh, wow. You know, going from uh, being again can do attitude in the house. I'm a daddy. I change diapers. I wash butts. I clean dishes. I do everything except fold laundry. You. <laughs> if you you ask still me, ain't folding laundry. If, no. If you ask me to fold the laundry, you're going to be waiting for two weeks. <laughs> and then at that, what I'm going to do for you is I'm going to clean it. Everything will be clean, but I'm going to leave it in the dryer. And if you need a shirt, I'm going to take everything out. I'm going to put that one shirt in the dryer. I'm going to flop it for you real quick because that's how I'm going to iron it. And here you go. So we've decided that I probably shouldn't do the laundry. But um, I grocery shop, uh, pick my son up from school. Um I pick out outfits. I cut you, the grass. You I do. Fighting. I'm a man. Of, I was a man of, of many, many things. And so uh, my fight began when I had to figure out how to be a dad that was struggling mm. to deal with his own diagnosis and my own symptoms and deal with side effects from my medicines and deal with um, just dealing with life because everybody has to go back to their life. And now you are left to figure out how do you live through this? Because, you know, they put that clock on your back and they say, hey, you got two years to live. You want to make it the best two years. And I also think that I didn't, I don't have a lot of regrets because once I got myself together, I started living every day how I wanted to live it. Good. If I wanted to do something, I did it. If yes. I wanted to go somewhere, I went. If I yes. wanted to eat something, I ate it. If yes. I wanted to buy something, I bought it. Come on. If I wanted to say something to you, I said it. Yes. Um, good or bad. Mm -hmm. And so for me, when I got this diagnosis and it kind of sat me down for a while I, and I had to sit and think about my life, I wasn't sad because I knew I had lived my life to the max. Mm. I got up every day and I gave it 110%. And some days on the days when I didn't feel like it, I gave it 120%, mm. you know? So, um, yeah. And so just, you know, looking back, that was big for me because I lived every day how I wanted to live it from mm. a certain point in my life. And uh, I was, I think I was very blessed to deal with that. But again, um, going home and um, it was very rough. You know, one of the things that you got to think about, and I hope that we are open enough to talk about this is, mm -hmm. as a husband, am I going to be affected by ED due to uh, chemotherapy? Mm -hmm. You know, because now that starts a whole nother conversation. Well, you know, how do you please your wife? Because even though you got cancer, she has needs. Mm -hmm. Um Dealing with things like, well, should I go to my son's school? Because I look really skinny and I don't want anybody to, you know, be looking at my wife or look at my son and feeling bad for them. And because, mm. you know, in our house, we are in a good space. Uh, we we got through this with uh, we're getting through it with the grace getting of God. Through it, that's right. Um, but again, you know, I just was thinking about all of these things. Mm -hmm. And so um I'm, I'm, I'm fighting, but right now it's a, it, it was a, at that point it was a losing battle because I was just mm. so overwhelmed mm -hmm. and you're dealing with chemotherapy. You got to deal with side effects. You go into doctor's appointments constantly. And so you never get to escape. You never get to escape your diagnosis because every day you're doing something that has to deal with it. And in days you're not, you're so tired and so sick that you just, um, you, sometimes you just want to lay in the bed and I had to become okay with not being okay some days. No, that's uh -huh. good because before you left, you was super. Oh yeah, I thought I was Superman, and everybody else did too. <laughs> uh, so many of my coworkers that have come to see me at home say it's so nice to see you sitting down. 
And so it used to me not sitting down. Well, and and I am going to say this, that you are definitely going to live longer than some damn two years. Yeah, we hopeful. No, we, we hopeful. are. We working. You are fighting. Absolutely. And I'm proud that you are fighting. Oh, absolutely. So, yeah. So that's why every time you say two years, that doesn't make me cry. Yep. <laughs> like all the other stuff made me cry because I know that God has the last say. Absolutely. And like he does, yep. you know. Yep. Um, and so I'm. I, I've, I'm, I'm, I am steadfast, I'm holding steadfast in that belief that God has the last say. Yep. And while we are all here, because who knows, you know, God forbid, my last day could be tomorrow because a truck could come by and hit me, you know? So God has the last say. So while we're here, we are going to live and experience every day. So, okay, so now you're fighting, you had chemo treatments, you, I'm just going to skip up a little bit because there's two more questions I want to ask and then we can end it unless okay. there's something else you want to say because this is your story to tell. Um, but now you're like on your 14th chemo treatment, your 13th, on, no, your 12th. I'm on number 12. You on number 12. I don't yep. know. Where did 14 come from? Did you say the number 14? Nope, number 12. I don't know. We. I'm going to see. What, I don't know why 14 stood out in my head because every single treatment, I know it was like every other Monday, every mm -hmm. other Monday, every yep. other Monday. So you're on your 12th treatment. Um, The medication has to shift. Yep. Right. So, because, so yeah. while while we being honest, please, because um, you know, this this is a, this is a it's a battle. It's a circle of trust, um, and I'm okay with sharing it. My current the uh, my current chemo stopped working, um, and so now we shift into another treatment. Uh, I do some some natural holistic things at home, kind of to supplement my treatment. But you know, just and being honest, um, and this is this is a lot more information than a lot of people know right now. Um, you, well, should, you know, I don't share much. But. Well, let me, so, so let's be specific. So when you first came home, mm -hmm. the first treatment that you had, you had yep. two treatments, I think two medications together. So I have, so six medications. Oh Lord. Okay. Yep. Six medications together in this chemo. And let me just tell y'all that his liver was had so many tumors that it was protruding outside of his stomach. Now he already just has a six, eight pack. I call you an eight pack because he, I told you he's just always been very physically fit, worked, worked out really hard. So he has his eight pack and then this liver was protruding through his stomach. Mm -hmm. And so, but after he came back and started to get the treatment, the liver just started to shrink because a liver can heal itself. Like yep. a liver is an organ that's miraculous. It can heal itself. Yep. So the liver just started to retract. You see his eight pack. And then he started to, so the chemo started working. The medicine was working. He started to put some weight back on, started to get a little bit more energy. And then it's kind of like, I guess there's an ebb and a flow to this whole treatment thing, because then like he's feeling good. You talk to him, you know, he's up, he's around. And then all of a sudden you call him and he's like in a fetal position again, because uh, a medicine threw some new symptoms, some neuropathy or, you know, so anywho, right now, currently, um, you, he just found out two days ago yeah. on Friday but the morning that you came here, mm -hmm. that the medication uh, stopped working because at some point his markers had started to go down. Yep. And we had like a no cancer party because we still claiming that. So we had the no cancer party. And he like, child, this is how he looked. And so um, we like. We didn't have we, a no cancer party. <laughs> we they did because his markers, you know, because he had been working so hard. And so we started it was working. However, the way this whole chemo cancer thing works Oh, I hate cancer so much. But um, so we went from there to now where he is, is just finding out Friday that the medication isn't working anymore. And now they have to try something new. Yep. But you're still fighting. Oh, absolutely. And we're still figuring out what the new thing is. Right. Absolutely. And then just, to, you know, I always like to throw these things in there. Um, you know, God provides you to I don't know how religious that everybody watching is, but God provides you the opportunity to fight. Um, and I'm a hundred percent thankful for the opportunity. He gave me the opportunity to fight when he sent me home yes. and he's continuing to give me, give me the opportunity to fight. And, uh, anybody that knows me knows I'm not one to turn down a fight. Um, and so I, I won't say, I won't say I'm enjoying this ride, but it's, 
it's, it's definitely a challenge. Um, and I, I look forward to just being able, uh, you know, me getting diagnosed with cancer has kind of opened a door where people kind of want to talk to me more. Um, and it's opened a door for me to just express things about life and, you know, how I view life and how thankful I am to be here. Um, how thankful I am for the opportunities to fight through this disease. Um, you know, uh, Eric Thomas says this thing where, you know, pain doesn't last forever. Uh, one day it will be replaced by something. Um, and I'm, I'm a firm believer in that whether one day I beat this or one day it beats me, it's okay. Because, you know, I, I take pride in the fight and, uh, you know, I'm thankful that I'm, you know, I'm able to have my support system and they, and they there with me because a lot of times they hold me up, um, because I, I don't have the strength to fight it by myself and my support system was provided for me through God. And, you know, I'm, I'm very God fear, man. I always have been not something I've always talked about. Um, but I'm, I'm just so thankful for the opportunity to fight, um, that I take great pride in, you know, taking care of myself still and, you know, uh, making sure I make my chemo treatments, even though I don't, usually don't want to go and I complain while I'm walking in, I complain while I'm getting the treatment. But again, I'm thankful for the quality of life that has given me because now it's one more day I get to be a dad. It's one more day I get to be a husband. It's one more day I get to be a son. I just take it a day at a time. And, uh, you know, I'm a hundred percent thankful for that. Um, I'm thankful for the fight. Um, I, I've been fighting all my life, mm. you know, to kind of bring this full circle um, you never know what God is preparing you for. Mm. Um, God been preparing me for this fight my whole life. I do believe that your life is written down. I think that you end up exactly where you're supposed to end up because again, it's, it's not really our life. We just a vessel for God. Mm. And, uh, and so for me, you know, I ended up exactly where I'm supposed to be. And I know a lot of people that wouldn't have taken this like this and, uh, you know, uh, sometimes I wish I would have got chosen to fight this battle, but uh, whatever it is, you know, I, I think that we, we taking it on and, and we doing what we can and we still live in life. We still love life. We still happy. Um, and I, I'm happy to be here and I'm still happy. Uh, like I said, I'm going to say this until I'm blue in the face um, more than anything. I'm grateful for the opportunity to still continue to be a father. Mm, it's so good. Okay, I I think that might be it. Um, and what I would say is for all of the family and friends who have um, reached out to me to ask me, what's up with Jamal? What happened to Jamal? How is Jamal? Let me know where Jamal is. Um, it's not my story to tell. Nope. But today you get to hear Jamal's story. This is Jamal's story to tell. Um, yeah, because, uh, you know, just to, the person that I am, you know, I I, I understand what, um, I understand that my story is my story to tell. I don't want nobody else telling my story. Absolutely. So that's for anybody out there who ever wanted to know that. Andrea going to tell her own story and say what she needs to say. So you don't ever have to speak for me in that way. And so I'm never going, I'm going to respect people in the same way and, uh, you know, spe re respect people's privacy. So doesn't matter to me. I mean, you know, plenty of people. I mean, people even in my life was like, you know, how's Jamal? What's Jamal? How's Jamal? How's, you know? None of your business. Call I didn't say that. <laughs> But, and you know, honestly, I, I, I don't, I don't, I didn't even answer because to me, any answer was an answer, right. you know? Yeah. So reach out to Jamal, then there's what comes next. So, so what, where is he? What do you have? Like, I, I just can't ask me something else and I'll give you an answer. But this, this, this is life altering, yeah. not for, for, not only for him, but for his son, for his wife. You know, for his mama and for me, <laughs> like this is life altering. So this for me, this was nothing for me to talk about, like to anyone, you know, unless Jamal included them in on the conversation. And I say that with peace and with love and, um, and I don't change it. I stand on that. I stand on it. I stand on that. And I love you, son, so much. I love you, too. And you fighting, and I'm fighting with you. Oh, yeah. You and see. I got your back, boo. Yep. 
I got your back. Even I when I told the doctor, hold him here till I get off work. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got I, your back. Oh, oh uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm just, done. Yeah, you finished it. I just want to say one thing. So I want to just... Uh, Go ahead. Uh, I want to say thank you for allowing me to use your platform uh, to tell my story. Uh, it was super important to me because uh, I just I want to help. I want to help people. Um, I want to reach people. Um, and uh, I just like to show that, you know, we are stronger than our demons um, and that you can still continue to live your life. And so it was. I think you know how important it was for me for me to finally talk about this and for me to talk about it with you. It it made it special for me. So I just want to say thank you. Uh, yeah, just want to say thank you. Uh, and uh, just I'm gonna look here now. Uh, I want to say thank you to uh, everybody who, uh, for lack of a better term, I allowed to be there for me uh, initially that I trusted, to, you know, not only take care of me, but take care of my business. That was very important to me. I didn't want this out until I wanted it out. Um, not that I was embarrassed about it, but I just think some things come in due time. And so, um, you know, I uh, want to say thank you to all those people. Uh, I already thanked all the platoon sergeants from my organization, my command sergeant major, sergeant major Thacker. Um, I want to say thank you to Staff Sergeant Buffington, who was my non-medical attendant, took great care of me. Uh, I don't know how I would have got home without him. Buff took great care of me. So thank you, Buff. I love you, bro. I love you forever. Um, yeah, I just want to say thank I just want to say thank you. And uh, I just want to say to anybody watching this that, you know, even though we crying, we uh, we we happy over here. Yeah, uh, we, we are. We love life. And, we are, you know, we, we, we living it together and we getting yes. through it. And, you know, this, this just for me was just I wanted to, uh, you know, just kind of open up about it and. You know, I wanted to talk about it. And, you know, I also want to tell uh, men that think like myself, go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that you are the best asset to your family. We, you know, we know we a lot of times we want to bring money and put money in the house, but you can't put money in the house if you're not there. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also want to, uh, my last thank you, I want to say thank you to the Army. Um, the Army's took, uh, has taken great care of me. Um, I don't know any other job in the world that uh, will be provide me the opportunity to get my chemotherapy and spend time with my family. Um, you know, I'm, I'm probably going to retire at 100%. I'm going to get paid for the rest of my life, however long that is. And uh, when I pass away, it'll go to my son. And, you know, uh, I'm 100% thankful for that. Um, that organization changed my life. Um, and, you know, for anybody that's uh, thinking about it, and I never push Army, I never push college, you know, if you're thinking about it, get the information. Um, it, it, it changed my life for the better. I met some great people, uh, met great mentors. Uh, first Sergeant Retired Mills, Master Sergeant McDaniel, uh, Master uh, First Sergeant King, um, Sergeant Major Fryer. So many people um, that I can name. Lieutenant Colonel Sanchez, um, First Sergeant, Sergeant Major Crew, um, Captain Hawkins. All of these people that I met, and they just had this impact on my life. And it got me to where I am. And so I just want to say thank you. I want to say thank you to everybody, but you know, mostly to you, this is my girl. And uh, it just made it special to be able to share my story today with her. So I just want to say thank you. You don't ever have to thank me. No, we gonna say you. thank you. No, I love you. Yeah. <laughs> we gonna say thank you. Oh. Oh, we say thank you. Mm, I love you thank so you. much. I love, I you, love you so much. And it's, <laughs> oh gosh. Yeah, I want you to, I'm, I'm glad I, I had a place for you to yeah. even share your story. God makes a way. God always makes a way. Yeah. <gasps> okay. All right. I think they say that's bad radio though. Like when you got like radio silence and the crying and I, stuff for I, me. You know, no, this, this, for this, me. this is ghetto though. <laughs> this is ghetto though. So this is good. Like I think we should just do what we want. <laughs> Cool. Radio Solid, shut up. Oh, Come gosh. On. Oh, Lord. Yeah, so this was impromptu. It was not planned, but my baby wanted a place to tell his story. And hey, baby, I got a place, so tell it. I love you so freaking much. And too. anybody who knows me knows 
how much I love Jamal. Jimbo, Jimbo, hey, big. Uh, while we talking about I love you, big. I love you to my wife and my son. Yes, uh, Shakima. I, yeah, I love y'all more than life is not peace. Yeah. Thank you, <laughs> thank you for dealing with me. So, uh, All right, y'all. So thank y'all for listening to another episode. This was a special edition. Another episode of Mental Health is a Lifestyle Podcast with your girl, Andrea Wise Brown. Angie Ponji. <laughs> <laughs> they don't call me that. Oh, they don't. <laughs> I'll see you guys on the next episode. And please share this. Share this episode.